introduce myself and to welcome you. My name is George Anitas. I'm the interim principal here at Frontier Regional. Uh, I want to welcome you uh, to this evening, uh, this informational evening tonight about the transition from 8th grade to 9th grade. Um, I also want to just uh, let people know that we are recording this. Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, and this will be on our website. So if you want to, if you have friends that weren't able to make it tonight uh, and you wanted to be able to share information with them, uh, the, the information, the video will be on our website. So just be aware of that also. So this evening, um, Shelly Allen is going to be walking you through uh, and explaining a lot, giving a lot of information. Uh, you're in very capable hands. Uh, she knows the stuff inside and out. Uh, your children are in very capable hands. Uh, if you have any further questions, though, after this evening, don't be afraid to uh, post uh, administration or to, to reach out to your child's guidance counselor. Uh, we'll always be there to help. So I, I do want to turn the, the evening over to Shelly. She, uh, she'll, be, she'll be speaking to you about a lot of uh, important things. Um, um, so thanks very much for coming out tonight. Um, we appreciate your support in the guidance office. Um, we have started this week by doing interest inventories with your students. Hopefully some of you have heard about that. Um, we have them go on a website um, in both 8th and 10th grade. There are two different modules, one for middle school students, one for high school students. And we talk to them about the fact that they're not making final decisions. They're just trying to get an indication of what they might be interested in because they're going to start to have more choice in terms of the courses they want to select um, and having some information, if they have some ideas in mind, can be helpful. For instance, one of the things we're going to talk about is the fact that when you get to ninth grade, some people take one science class and some take two. And the reason that they might want to do that is if they're trying to get through the maximum science curriculum that they can by the time they graduate, then they want to double up freshman year. For other students, they may despise science. That may be their worst subject. And they don't want to do that. Um, but we have them do an interest inventory so they can start to get a sense if there are things that they're interested in, what majors would correspond with that, how they might best prepare in high school. And we tell them we're going to revisit this in 10th grade because certainly as juniors and seniors, they're going to have even more flexibility uh, for electives in their schedule. Um, the other thing is, um, we encourage them to meet with us. Um, so while we're working with them in small groups in the advisory this week, we're starting with the in interest inventories, and tomorrow and Thursday we'll work on actual schedules um, similar to what we've provided to you this evening. We encourage them to sign up to meet with us individually with questions. And I'm going to offer the same thing to you before I even start the presentation. Because as Mr. Lanita said, there's a lot of information. And we want to give you an overview <coughs> because some people find it helpful to do a four-year plan. They know where they want to get by the time they graduate. And because of prerequisites, it makes sense that you need to work your way backwards and see what you need to take in order to be eligible to take the next course in the sequence. Um, other people prefer to sort of work on one year at a time. Um, and we want you to do whatever works and whatever is comfortable for you. Um, so, fortunately, the touch screen didn't work, so I will be going back and forth. Um, there are three guidance counselors. Um, I work with people at the very end of the alphabet, 7 through 12. Ms. Gallanter works with people at the beginning of the alphabet, 7 through 12. And Ms. Yonet works with students in the middle of the alphabet. Um, if you don't know who your students schedule, uh, who your student's counselor is, it is on their schedule. Um, they should have that in the front of their agenda book, so, or you can simply call the office um, if you have questions and you want to talk to a guidance counselor or you want to schedule an appointment. Ms. Lipinski is our assistant and she's wonderful. So tonight I'm going to cover frontier graduation requirements. I'm going to speak briefly about how that corresponds with college admissions requirements. I'm going to talk about credits for graduation, the attendance policy, course levels, grade point averages, course sequencing in the variety of departments. I'm going to show some sample schedules and obviously take questions. If there's something where you feel it doesn't make sense to wait till the end, certainly you know feel free to raise your hand. 
not only will I though take general questions at the end, but I know sometimes people have things that they want to ask personally, and I will be happy to stay afterwards and answer things on an individual basis if it's not something you want to discuss in a group format. Okay, so um, we do talk to students about the term prerequisites because it's not something they're always familiar with. And we have two kinds of prerequisites here at Frontier. We have course sequencing. In other words, you can't take one course until you've had another. It makes most sense if I use language as an example. You don't take French 2 until you have French 1. For some courses, though, we also have grade prerequisites above a passing grade. Departmentally, math and foreign language, it's sequential learning. So unless you have a C average or better, you cannot go on to the next course. And there are some individual courses that have that policy as well, but we introduce students to the concept of prerequisites and understanding that if they want to get here by senior year, they need to understand the sequencing and back it up to sometimes as early as freshman. We also introduced the concept of earning credits. In seventh and eighth grade, they have not had to worry about earning credits. Um, and so we talked to them about the fact that credits are earned by passing grades. We talked to them about the number of credits they'll take per semester and per year. Now may I ask, does anybody in the audience currently have a high school student in their household? Okay, so this is a change. For those of you who attended this presentation when your um, high school students were rising, it would have said 20 credits each semester, 40 credits a year for a total of 160 credits. Beginning with next year's ninth grade, we are introducing a required course, um, and the acronym is PACE, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I want to try to point out when there's changes so that this isn't confusing um, as, and, and understand that there are some differences. Okay, so the other thing that we'll be talking to students about is how the day compares and contrasts between middle school and high school. Um, so in middle school, your students have really been with their team of teachers in the four core academic subjects, math, science, social studies, and English. They've been with that team of teachers for 75% of the day. They have those classes every day. They then have their advisory period, their half hour advisory, where they go for assistance, sort of like reverse homeroom. Um, and then they go to exploratories. And some exploratories have lasted year long, so that if your student is in band, strings, or chorus, those are year long exploratories. All the other exploratories are half a year, some of them every day, some of them every other day. So that compares and contrasts to the high school model in this way. Um, our high school is, what, is on a, what's called a long walk. Again, if you have students um, in high school, you're going to be used to four blocks, A, B, C, and D, all long walks about 80 minutes in length. Beginning next year, um, there are still going to be four long blocks. There's going to be the short pace block, which again, I'll talk more about, but a little bit different. Um, and these classes, except for AP and band and strings, are half year. Because when I was in high school, and some of you maybe, um, periods were only about 40, 45 minutes long. You switched about seven, eight times a day, depending on your school. There was t attendance taken um, every period. There was a lot of lost time on learning um, because you were up and down and working with a new teacher. Um, this school went to the long block schedule about 15, 20 years ago so that you're not making as many transitions. You're having about double the amount of time in a class and you're completing most classes in half a year. So instead of doing seven or eight classes at a time, you're doing four or five classes at a time, depending. Okay. We also talked to your eighth graders about attendance. And so in high school, um, credit is only given if you have enough basically seat 
time, I'll call it. Um, if you miss more than 10% of your classes, even if you're passing those classes, we can't give you credit for those. So in an everyday class, once you hit 10 absences, you don't receive credit. And in every other day class, the 10% the comes at five classes per semester. Now obviously, if someone has a severe enough medical issue where they're seeing a physician or a dentist or what have you, and they have medical notes, those are excused absences. Um, if um, someone has court appointments, um, those are excused absences. Um, they make exceptions for deaths in the family, uh, things of that nature. But choosing to take a vacation during the school year still counts towards that credit. And so that's something that's different from middle school to high school, and we explain it to students, but we also, and it's in the handbook, but we want to make sure that parents understand that as well, because it's a big change from the middle school to high school. The other thing that happens in high school that's a little bit different um, is that there is more leveling of courses. So physical education, skills, ESD, our new support, class, um, level zero, and there will be additional slides to explain this. Level one is our general college prep. That's what most of our courses are at Frontier. We then have some classes that are offered at the honors level that students can choose to take, um, and then we offer quite an array of advanced placement classes, and I will go over those uh, by department. It's important to know that the levels correspond with additional GPA points. So while a student typically is doing more work depending on the level, the reward is that they have the potential of earning more points towards their GPA. Um, that's important to colleges typically, um, who are looking at students and asking you know, where do they fall? What decile are they in compared to other students? How rigorous is their schedule compared to other students? And so the whole ranking and leveling and GPA point system is all focused for that information. We do not rank individually here at Frontier, only by decile. And um, so what you can see, if you look at a, a level one course and you receive an A, then the traditional 4.0 GPA points are going in. If you're doing an AP class and you earn an A, 4.7. So that there, that there is an incentive for doing that extra work, if you will. So now offerings by department. So I talked a little bit about the levels. X designates our honors level here. So whenever you see an X level course, that's the honors designation. Um, all of our ninth graders take some form of English 9. They will either take regular English, line, English 9 at the college prep level, or they will take English 9 at the honors level. They will not make that choice until they start the course. Um, those teachers will give out two rubrics, <coughs> what the expectations are, what the work is, and students will be asked to make that choice, whether they have that class in the fall or whether they have that class in the spring. Now, there is no additional summer work for English, so that's one of the reasons why they're not making that choice ahead of time, and this will make more sense when I talk about other departments because everybody has to do summer reading at Frontier. So the English department is responsible for the general summer reading by grade. They don't give an additional summer assignment if you're doing honors work. That's why you're not making that choice until you start the course in the fall or the spring. English 10 works the same way. In 11th grade, you can choose between regular English 11, AP English Language or AP English Literature. Two different AP classes. Um, now, one of the things I should say is that when your child is a rising 9th, 10th, or 11th grade student, you will be invited to AP night. Um, that's happening 
uh, for our high school parents on Thursday this week where the AP teachers will be there to describe their curriculum, to describe the work expectations. Uh, because these are national, this is a national curriculum that each teacher is teaching. And so they'd like the opportunity to present to parents what the workload and what the expectations are like. So there is additional information as we go through the years and you have those choices. In 12th grade, students will also be required to take an English either at the regular level, one of the AP classes, or there's an elective called college writing. Uh, this is a class that a lot of our seniors choose to take. They're working on different kinds of writing that they will be doing at the college level. They also are, it's always offered in the fall. Um, the English teachers work with students in that class on their college essay. Um, so it, people enjoy taking that class as an option as well. There certainly are electives in the English department that people may choose to take. Journalism, a theater practicum slash playwriting class, and next year, a new offering by one of our English teachers called Advanced Writing Seminar. Um, this is a two and a half credit elective for those students that like to write. Um, she is hoping to turn this into a peer tutoring program. Um, so it's being offered to sophomores and juniors next year. So different offerings. Um, so some things change on a year-to-year -year basis. We're excited about this. Um, and everyone needs to take one English course a year. Math. Um, this is probably our most diverse department in terms of offerings. Um, I put together a couple of sheets that are called paths. And I don't mean to imply that math is limited to five paths or that science is limited to three. Uh, because there are probably, when we think about the variety of things that people have done in terms of math sequencing, about eight or ten. Uh, but we're trying to give you an idea that there are different ways that students choose and, and their parents choose to go through the curriculum depending on their comfort level with a particular subject, their enjoyment of a particular subject, and their goals, where they want to end up. Um, the eighth grade math teachers make a recommendation based on the work that students have been doing um, in eighth grade math as to what the, they believe is the best sequencing of courses for them in ninth grade. Um, I can tell you that they have a very good track record, if you will, um, when they make a recommendation, um, they have typically been spot on. Um, if you disagree with the recommendation, you are able to request something different in writing. Um, but I can, I can say that um, they, are, they are very good at understanding what the high school curriculum is and knowing what sort of a background in math people need to be able to meet the expectations of each of the sequences. So there are basically four options that people are starting in depending on what they've done in middle school. Some students came in very, very strong in math and they took advanced math in seventh and eighth grade. They did exceptionally well in it. They will have completed the equivalent of high school algebra one by the end of eighth grade. And they will be encouraged, if they've been strong in that, to go on and start probably with honors geometry, quite frankly, um, in ninth grade. Some people did the honors math, but they struggled through it. They got the grade, but they did lots of retakes. Um, they had to do a lot of redos. And the math teacher may say, you know, you technically can do that, but you're going to struggle going jumping into honors geometry. You'd have a much more solid foundation if you started off your freshman year with Algebra 1 and have that foundation so that you don't struggle all the way through. Students who have done regular math, um, will either have done very well in that and all of a sudden that abstract information will have clicked and the teacher may say, you can go right into Algebra 1. One semester, fast-paced Algebra 1. Other people may have been in regular math and that may not have been their strongest area. And the teacher may say, we need to slow down Algebra for you. You're going to start freshman year doing Algebra 1A every other day, all year long. 
and then you'll do the second part of algebra in your sophomore year, first semester, and you'll see geometry by second semester. Other people may really be struggling in math. They may be struggling with the pre-algebra concepts right now. And they may be recommended to do uh, every other day fundamentals of math together with their Algebra 1A. So as I said, that's, that's just the first year. And that's why there are so many different paths, because where you go from there depends on how you do. Um, and some people get to upper level math, and they may have been on a fast path pace sequence, and then the choice of AP comes, and they go, oh, I just don't want to do this at the AP level. I want to slow it back to honors. You know, so there, there is different sequencing, and it really is an evaluation that should be made on a yearly basis. Um, but if you have any questions about your teacher's, your, your eighth grade teacher's math recommendation, I would encourage you to contact the teacher and ask why. Um, we have geometry at the honors or regular le level, algebra two at the regular honors level. We have topics in discrete mathematics. So for students who have really not enjoyed math, but they need a math senior year, uh, that's often a path they may choose. Other people are headed to free calculus, calculus, modern statistics, AP statistics, AP calculus. What I can say is if math is your child's strong suit and you want to get them to the AP statistics and AP calculus one junior year and one senior year, then if they have already done algebra one in eighth grade, they're going to do geometry X freshman year, Sophomore year, they're going to need to double up with Algebra 2 and Pre-Calculus because Pre-Calculus will be the prerequisite to go to AP Calculus. So th that's what I mean by the four-year plan in sequencing. If you know now what your child's strengths are, that's a great question for their guidance counselor. If I know that I want them to be have the potential of doing both AP classes for graduation, what do I need to have them do? before they get to those classes. Makes sense so far. Um, and that's why I sort of did um, a number of paths. Like I said, not meant to imply that these would be only five paths, but to give some sort of sequencing. So not strong in math to absolutely adore it and want to max out in terms of the offer. Science. 
For students who dislike science, it's their least favorite subject, they're probably only going to choose to take science and technology freshman year. They're going to do their one science course in biology sophomore year. Junior year, they'll take chemistry, and they'll pick an elective for senior year. If they love science, and they want to get through the maximum number of science classes that they can, they're going to want to double up in science freshman year. They're going to want to take both biology and science and technology their first year. That's going to leave them free to double up junior year, take chemistry and another elective. Maybe they are interested in the medical field and they want to take anatomy and physiology. And that's going to leave them available to take, we offer science classes every two years. <coughs> so this year we have offered AP Chemistry and AP Environmental. Next year we'll offer AP Biology and AP Physics and we do that on a rotating basis. So they'd be able to take, if they wanted, one of the AP classes, both junior and senior year. Or you might go someplace in the middle. You might, as a, an eighth grader, say, oh yeah, I, I love science. Take two, and then want to get off that double path, because you don't want to go to AP. You decide halfway through, you know, by, by the end of sophomore year. So that's fine. You just need to do a total of 20 credits. We have students who sometimes leave with 40 credits in science.
um, and probably they are athletes or they're in the music program or the theater program, that they are struggling to get everything done. And so we're going to require that at least one semester a year they have a directed study, the acronym being PACE. But they can do that both semesters. Now if a student is on an IEP and is taking skills as part of their IEP, they do not do both PACE and skills. It's an either or situation. And that's where the extra credits are coming for those of you who are used to 40 credits a year. It's going up to 45. So if they only do one pace, that's going to leave them with an extra two and a half credits for some electives that they haven't also had room in their schedule for. Okay, there are a number of other electives. Um, we are offering an AP capstone and an AP diploma program. Um, that students can choose to take if they want. The AP Capstone program involves two classes, AP Seminar, which we introduced last year, and AP Research, which we'll be offering this upcoming year. They're sequential. You had to do seminar before research, so this was our first year with the program. That's why we're introducing AP Research next year. If you take both seminar and research, and you get a three or better on the national standardized exam, you will, your student would be eligible for an AP capstone designation. The AP diploma is the same criteria plus four additional AP classes also scoring a three or better. So a much higher standard in, for the diploma than the capstone. Those are opportunities um, that a lot of high schools have been offering, um, and we're very pleased to have that opportunity out there for those students that are interested in that sort of thing. We also have a number of electives in the visual arts, the performing arts, music, um, industrial technology, or wood shop for those, <laughs> um, information technology, and then consumer health education. Um, and we have students that go to art school and our art teachers work with them on their portfolios. And instead of taking electives in social studies as they're filling their schedules or in science, they're taking every elective that Mr. Purcell offers up through portfolio and design as he works with them to prepare their portfolios for their portfolio days. So, Whatever your child's interests are, there are opportunities to help them get to where they want to go and to refine those interests as they're going through the four years. The ninth and 10th grade year, there are more requirements. Um, we still have the MCAS exam, um, that, that high stakes testing um, that the state requires as part of earning a diploma. And so we front load a lot of the requirements um, because students, we are required that, to have students take the English language arts and the math and pass at the end of their sophomore year. We have them do the science exam at the end of their ninth grade year. Um, some schools have students do it all three in the same year. We find that it's better that they're taking one where we have the option because science is an end of course test as opposed to a specific grade test. Um, so a lot of the requirements are front loaded, ninth and 10th grade, they still have quite a bit of flexibility, but in junior and senior year, even more as they have sort of refined their interests. Some other options. Um, there are four things that I'd like to talk about that are really available to juniors and seniors. And while I don't want to dwell and spend a lot of time on it, because I know your students are going into ninth grade, I think it's important on a night like this that you know the full range of options available here in Frontier. Um, we participate in what is called virtual high school, VHS. Um, we have um, seats in a national online program 
where students are able to take courses that we don't offer here at Frontier as one of their electives junior and senior year. So I have had students do um, things like Irish literature. We don't have a class in Irish literature. Um, they can't take these classes to replace a requirement. These are electives in addition to our requirements. So this would be a student who loved English. They're doing the regular English 11 or 12, but they want to take something extra in English that Frontier doesn't offer. Um, so virtual high school has been a way for students to get some exposure. Um, I think for a small school, we offer a lot of electives, but I'm not gonna tell you we can offer everything. We don't have astronomy. Um, you know, and things of that nature. And some of our students have an interest in those areas and they're able to take a class online um, through VHS. We have some students that do independent studies, and this is really directed research with a faculty member. This is a student who has just a, a burning desire to explore a subject more in depth. Um, one of my favorite examples is if I have a student that's taken the traditional anatomy and physiology course, and again, I'm not a medical person, but if there are 14 systems in the body, our traditional course gets through seven or eight of them. And if I have a student wanting to go on to medical school, they may want to do some research under a faculty member on the rest of the systems of the body so that they have familiarity with that before they go on to college. So this is an opportunity, and um, I find that our faculty members, they do this as an overload. They're very generous with their time. Um, for students that have a specific research interest where they just want to go beyond the curriculum. School of Community Service. Um, we have students that do, um, that take some of their elective times. They can only do a maximum of five credits a year, junior and senior year, where they are looking to get some exposure to something. Um, one of my favorites is that, you know, we have people that want to be teachers, and they go over to Deerfield Elementary, they walk across the street for a block, and they may work with a teacher. Um, so we encourage them to do something that's career relevant um, whenever possible. Um, although some of them are doing it for more community service hours, um, they may be looking to do this because they're on National Honor Society, or they have just an interest in volunteering. And with parent approval, they can do that. We have a few students every year that do um, dual enrollment. Um, a lot of schools refer to it as just early entry. We allow students, if they're interested, to do it um, beginning junior year. They must have a minimum of a 3.0 in order to be able to apply. That's our rule, not the community college rule. Um, they do not limit it to community college. Every year we have a student or two that you know looks into a UMass or a Smith. Um, this is something where They've decided they want to either do a combination enrollment where they're taking some of their classes here um, and some at a college, or they may want to start and do their entire program at the school. Um, and so we work with students who are interested in that. Um, I had a student relatively recently who just wanted to take one course. She was taking her AP courses here but she wanted to learn American Sign Language. Um, she had a personal interest in that. We don't offer American Sign Language. Um, and so she went up to GCC and took that course. Um, she arranged to take a class outside of our schedule here um, and did that. And then we have other people who are, well, they know exactly what they want to do and they are focused on getting their associate's degree early and they do dual enrollment full time, typically during their senior. So, so that's an option that's available as well. Okay. So what happens is that, as I mentioned, um, tomorrow and Thursday, um, we're going to be working with students. They're going to get some of the same yellow forms that you have. But they will also be using their Chromebooks to put in requests online. They will be limited in terms of, of course, everybody will be put in for an English 9. As I mentioned, they won't choose the honors designation until later. They'll have to choose whether they're taking World History 1 at the regular level or the honors level. Are they going to want to do the summer work, um, do the extra research papers, that sort of thing. They'll have been given a math recommendation. So they're going to fill out their online requests at the 
same time, we're going to make them fill out the yellow piece of paper because they need to take this home and get your signature because you get to override whatever choice they've made. <laughs> um, and that's important for you to know. Um, we're going to ask them to have this back to us uh, before they leave for vacation on the 15th. Um, and um, like I said, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. What happens from there is that we then take those requests and we look at how many requests we have for each course. Now, if I go to Mr. Lanitas and I say, I only have four kids that signed up for X, and I won't name <coughs> X or L. Jinkson, um, he's going to say, that class can't run next year. So what we need people to understand and what we talk to your students about is, at this point in the process, these are requests. These are not your guaranteed schedule. Um, because we need to be financially responsible to the district and run courses that have uh, a healthy number. So that's the first thing we're looking at. The next thing is not all classes that a child selects is they're able to take. We ask them to put down alternatives on their hard copy sheets. And the reason for it, that is they may pick two classes that are singletons that we offer once a year that happen to fall the exact same way. And so then we need to go to their alternatives. So at this point, we, we need people to understand and we need students to understand that they are requests. We're going to do our best to make that schedule happen, but not everything that they sign up for may run. And they may have conflicts, so that's why the alternatives are important. Because we're still working on these schedules sometimes after school ends. And so if we don't have the alternatives, we're going to put students in classes that have openings as opposed to what they might have preferred. So we encourage them to have options there. Um, then what happens is the second week of August, schedules are mailed home. Um, they are going to have the courses, the locations, the teacher names. And this is important because we invite you and your students to come into the school once you receive the schedule and walk around the building because some of them need that to make them feel comfortable that they know where all the rooms are. Um, and guidance counselors are back five days before school begins. So if there are any questions or issues, we encourage you to contact us and make appointments to come in and meet with us um, because to whatever extent possible, we like to get things resolved before school begins. We do have a five day ad drop period, but to the extent that people are settled, that's just easier all around. Um, but we do encourage you, if you have students that, we are the same building, and, and we are a very small building in actuality, but for some people, the unknown makes them nervous. And we have found that just by saying, you know, once that schedule comes in the mail, come in and walk around the building, um, those last couple of weeks of August, some people just feel better once they've identified where all their rooms are so that they know that first day of school, they know exactly where they're going to go. And, and we would encourage you to do that. We do have sort of a modified step-up program in June. Um, we run literally a three-ring circus. The six, after graduation, and the seniors are gone so that we can have sort of equivalent lunches. The sixth graders come up, meet with the seventh grade teachers. The seventh grade students meet with the eighth grade teachers. The eighth grade students come, go and meet with um, a lot of their ninth grade teachers. And so we run a morning where it's sort of everybody stepping up. So they do get to go into the high school, but I think that for anybody that's sort of anxious about where they're going, actually walking around with the schedule, with the room numbers, and seeing exactly where they are can just make that just a, a much easier process. So those schedules do get mailed in. It's the year-long schedule. It will tell you, is the course all year long like band? So if this child is taking band, um, or is it a semester one class or a semester two class? And this is what it looks like sort of in the non-schedule. I took that same schedule and just sort of placed it out. Okay, so this particular student Students. They're going to take that in that short block where it's not going to compete with anything else. That's the only thing that's going to be offered in that short block. Because remember, seven-eighths of our students are not in the music program. We've got to have something for them to do. So 
they're going to either be in a PACE class or they, they might take a class that's not a singleton. So gym is offered multiple times a day. Health is offered multiple times a day. Um, but they're going to be, this person has man. They're going to take honors geometry. What do I do? Um, their PACE class is going to be every other day. Um, their required PACE class, they're going to take theirs first semester. They've got their world history honors class first semester, and they've got biology. This person's doubling up in science. You said that ice cream wasn't Whoa, it wasn't earlier. <laughs> Can you show us what they want to pick in their choices at um, you know, on Sure, day? absolutely. So Let me just go through this semester two, science and technology. That's the required science class, physical education. This person is choosing to take art. Again, band is year long. They have decided to take Latin and they're going to start Latin 1 freshman year, and they're going to choose honors um, English. So yes, if I look at this, this is telling you everybody's taking English 9. They're not being given a choice about that. Everybody's taking science and technology. That's a given. And everyone will have at least a PACE class or skills. They're also going to have physical education and health 1. Their choice comes down. This person wanted to do world history at the honors level. So that was the choice that they are making. All students choose between. Um, this person did advanced math in middle school. They're going into geometry. The teacher said do it at the honors level. So they're picking geometry X under the math. And then below, they decided they wanted to double up in science. So they selected bio. They decided they were ready to start their language and they wanted to do Latin. So they selected Latin 1. And they had a two and a half credit space. They're starting with our introductory art class. So what we're asking on this bottom section is that they prioritize things in rank order. So if they really would prefer to do biology over language, and they may be taking other things, then they're going to put a number one with biology. If they want to make sure that they start their language first, then that should be their number one. Does that help? Sure. So the previous question she had, 
Sure. Um, on the previous schedule or semester? It says it says two, two five, five credit courses or four two and a half, but that schedule had two five credits and an elective of art or whatever it was for two and a half. Right, is that what you were asking? Yeah. And it didn't really that you didn't really clarify that for me. How they could have the two five credits and also have the two and a half credit in go to our on the previous schedule. Sure. Right. How many, how many do you choose then? It says only choose two, two five credit. So, so they had biology and they had um, Latin, but then they also were given a two and a half credit. Of, you said you said intro to art or intro to something. So, how were they able to get that if they couldn't choose it on here? Because they could only choose two five credits according to the sheet. Yeah. How do you know where to go? I'm sorry. I think that should be an answer. I think that's the confusion. Right, because mm -hmm. I found with my ninth yeah. grader, they want to choose more, but they can't. Yeah. They, but that person yeah, has more. But this is, a, this is a minimum. What we tell them is at least put those down. If you want to number them to eight, that's fine. Okay, so, so they should choose. So when my child fills this out, they choose two five credit and At least four. two five credits and four. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep, sorry. I didn't understand the question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you had the yeah. 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 were asking for yeah. All right. Let me just um, talk about a couple more things, and then I'll open it to questions generally. Um, I'd also like to explain sort of different things that guidance does with students um, over the years. Obviously, we meet with people individually all throughout. Um, and we do scheduling programming with your students every year. So we'll do this in eighth grade. Um, we will do it in ninth grade, in 10th grade, 11th grade. We will highlight each year new things that they're eligible for. For instance, if you remember, there are a lot of things that you become eligible for junior year that you weren't ninth and 10th grade. And we will focus on those. Um, we'd like to have them have an overview in eighth grade so that they can back it up if they want to do that four year planning. Sophomore year, um, we are requiring the PSATs. We will probably be requiring those of freshmen, too. Um, and we will offer, um, and this is a choice, the pre-ACT for sophomores. So the two college entrance exams are the SAT and the ACT. The PSAT is the pretest for the SAT. The pre-ACT is the pretest for the ACT. Um, the, the tests used to be much more, uh, much more variable than they are. They're coming closer and closer together all the time. It used to be that I would describe the ACTs as more of a content-based test. And the SATs, more, they had more logic and analytical reasoning questions. These, companies are coming closer and closer together every year, but we still like to offer the opportunity for people to take the free tests. It basically comes out that studies show that about a third of students do better on the ACT, a third do better on the SAT, and a third is a wash. So if they have that information, it can be helpful before they have to take the actual college exams. In addition to doing the interest inventory with them in eighth grade, we do the high school module in 10th grade, and we do that deliberately because, as I said, their schedules free up even more junior and senior year, and they have more room for electives, so we want them to sort of revisit that. They can go into this at any point in time. Once we've shown them and they have the account set up, we find if we don't have them do it, most of them don't go in until um, you know, we actually work with them again. Um, junior year, um, we also offer the PSATs if people want to take them twice. Um, we begin very specific college and career workshops. We have a huge mailing for seniors about the whole college process. Um, one of the things that's critical for seniors, is, uh, rising seniors, is that they fill out a questionnaire so that we can write the best reference letter possible. Um, we don't know everything off the top of our heads that they do outside of school, so we send home a mailing in the summer. Um, included in that is the two-page questionnaire. Now that faculty know we have that, they often like copies of it as well, so that when they're writing their references, they can include a more broad-ranged um, view of the student. Um, and again, we do uh, college and career workshops, you know, especially in the fall of senior year. 
Um, we offer financial aid night. We work with MIFA, the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority, um, who is one of the leaders here in Massachusetts, a nonprofit organization. So they're unbiased about what they're talking to people about, but they talk about the FAFSA, the CSS profile, um, and individual school applications. Um, and we would encourage you that as you have questions throughout the process from here on in, that you call, email, make an appointment to meet with your student's guidance counselor because we want you to have the information that you need and that you want to make these decisions and to get these questions answered. Um, but there obviously is programming that we do specifically. Um, at this point, I've talked an awful lot and you've been very patient with me. I appreciate that. Um, can I answer any general questions? Yes. Can you talk more to the PACE program ah. that all the students are being required to take? I know that high school parents get something in the mail saying that you're eliminating advisory, you're reducing the number of minutes for each academic block in order to make time for the block, but it's not really clear what's being instructed in this block. So it's what's called a, a directed study. Students <coughs> will be um, with two faculty members um, during this period of time. Um, so that there will be people available to assist them with work if they need to go see a specific teacher that they don't have as their instructor, they will be able to get a pass from that teacher to go at that time. So say um, they have uh, as their two teachers an English teacher and a science teacher, um, but they're having some issues with their math class. They will be able to get a pass ahead of time from that math teacher to be able to go and work with that person. Um, but the idea is that we're going to have uh, two teachers in a room with some different um, sort of content area expertise to be able to assist students. If they don't have homework that they need to be working on, there will be specific things that they can work on. This isn't a free-for-all where they can just sit and kick back. They won't be using their phones. Um, we are having people this year um, we had students in ninth and 10th grade, the school paid for them to take the PSATs. There is a link to what is called Khan Academy for a directed study plan for how they can improve their scores. That's one of the things that if they were not working on homework, that they would be instructed to do by those uh, teachers in the room and tasks like that. There will be a pre-approved list of activities. Sure. Other questions? Okay, I know that Mr. Lanitas wants to introduce Ms. Nelson, um, and I will certainly be available at the end for individual questions, but I do thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, and at this point I would like to introduce Carla Nelson, one of our foreign language teachers. She had asked to actually have a couple minutes of your time as well. Hi, I'm Carla Nelson. Thank you. I know you've had a lot already to think about, so I just wanted to introduce myself and let you know that I'm here with some handouts. If you have any questions for me, I know that your students have had a chance to briefly get to know Spanish a little bit and French in their exploratories, but they do not have an exploratory lab in, um, in, as a middle school student, so that's a choice that they can make in ninth grade. And so I just wanted to introduce myself and say that I. And here in the back, I have my list of top ten reasons why you might study Latin. And, um, <laughs> because it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no. so thank you very much. Right. Any other questions? Right. Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Just